One of the most divisive elements to come from the Danganronpa series has to be the ending of Danganronpa V3. In it, it was revealed that Danganronpa was just a fictional franchise, the cast of V3 are all fictional too, and that our main cast of characters want to end Danganronpa for good. With an ending like that, you can see pretty well why it was so divisive. And for the longest time, I absolutely despised it. I'm already not a big fan of the it is all just a dream type tropes, and when pieces of media call out its critics and the media itself. But what especially rubbed me the wrong way was that it felt like the game was scolding its fans for the mere act of liking Danganronpa itself. In fact, I was actually going to make a long video going in depth about how much I furiously hated the ending, but when I actually went to watch it to get a accurate perspective, I realized that thinking it was really wrong to like Danganronpa was barely in the ending at all. In fact, I realized that the true message of the ending was that Danganronpa will become tarnished and lifeless if it continues on, and if you are truly a fan of the series, you'd want it to end as much as Shuichi does. That is the very reason why Kodaka stated that he believes his players would side with Shuichi in an interview he had about the game. Okay, that was a pretty cool story about how I changed my mind about V3, but there's still a lot of time left in the video. What gives? Well, what if I told you that this newfound understanding of the game's themes made me realize the utter genius of two characters in particular, and if you've seen the thumbnail of this video, you know exactly which two I'm talking about. As I figured out the themes of V3's ending involve ending Danganronpa before it becomes stale, I realized that the game's mastermind, Tsubugi Shirogane, represents that very stalelessness that occurs through seasonal rot. Think about Tsumugi's two defining character traits, her use of anime references, and her constant talks of being plain. It's pretty obvious what the plain part of her personality represents, but what you probably didn't know is how many anime and video game references are in Danganronpa. Sure, you may know one or two references you might have gone on to, but references actually run deep into the series to the point where nearly all of the Japanese casting has some sort of inside joke relating to the irony of who is being casted. The most famous example of which is the sadistic Monokuma being voiced by the voice actress behind Doraemon, a famous kids show character in Japan. In that sense, I believe Samugi's constant use of references to the point of it being called out in the game itself is supposed to symbolize the style of Danganronpa boiled down to the most easy to replicate beats. Sure, the gimmicks of Danganronpa's psychopop nature is there with Samugi, but all of the heart that made Danganronpa special is sucked out, leaving us with only the bare minimum Danganronpa formula that gets repeated in every single game of the series. If you are a diehard fan of the series, you know exactly what I am talking about. Some important character dies in chapter 1, two people die in chapter 3, yada yada, so on and so forth. You can see that Samugi personifies the stagnation that comes with this formula with lines like Junko and Oshima didn't participate, she controlled the game from outside. Even if it's boring or repetitive, she's always the mastermind, isn't she? So that's what I believe Samugi represents, but what about Kaede Akamatsu, the other character this video talks about? Well, if Samugi represents how having Danganronpa continue would cause the series to lose its magic, Kaede represents the very magic that will be lost as the series continues. One of Danganronpa's biggest selling points is that you have absolutely no idea what to expect on your first playthrough. It's the reason why the fandom tells newcomers to never search at the series until they have completed it, and this feeling persists even in the sequels. Just when you think you know how Danganronpa works after playing Trigger Happy Havoc, its sequel, Goodbye Despair, turns it all on its head. Just from chapter 1 alone, you have the protagonist with the unknown talent, a setting that may or may not include magic? Two of the biggest spoilers from the first game revealed in the chapter 1 motive, and one of the original survivors, doing everything in their path to prevent the killing game from happening, which might actually work? These elements and more are able to keep players on their toes even after knowing the conventions of a typical Danganronpa game, allowing them to experience a truly unpredictable experience once more. 
Just like with Goodbye Despair, Kaede is able to subvert people's expectations, but because there is a significant gap between the releases of Goodbye Despair and V3, she also encapsulates what fans want in a new game. When it came to a new protagonist, the three things fans wanted to see was a female protagonist, a regular ultimate talent, and a personality that differs significantly from the previous protagonists, Makoto and Hajime. From her very introduction, or should I say second introduction since there's this plot at the beginning of the prologue which the cast gets ultimate memories planted into them, which does a great job at making players have no idea what will happen next, Kaede fits all three of these criteria. And that's not the only way she gives what the fans want. Like many stories in the horror or death game genre, fans like to theorize how one could beat the Danganronpa by killing game, usually with as few deaths as possible. Kaede imitates this mentality to beat the killing game twice, first by performing an escape attempt that could actually be successful depending on how much of an epic gamer you are, and second by weeding out the mastermind and killing them, which is a very popular idea fans have on ending the killing game since the mastermind is often made to be one of the classmates. Right from the get-go, Kaede brushes past all of Danganronpa's preconceived notions and gets straight to ending the killing game itself something that has been previously reserved for the final chapter. The fans are hyped, so much is going on right now, and we have no idea what to expect! And then she dies. In the final act of player subversion, it turns out that Kaede Akamatsu is the one behind the death of Rintaro Amami. Something that is a subversion in of itself, since we were led to believe he would play a heavily important role of V3. And, like all executions, we get to see this character who we thought would be the protagonist maimed and brutalized right in front of our eyes. We aren't just watching the death of a character, we are watching the death of Danganronpa itself. And that's not all. In Chapter 6, it turns out that the one running this whole killing game was none other than Samugi Shiragane herself, who framed Kaede for finishing Rintaro off in order to keep the killing game running according to the formula. There's no coincidence that the manifestation of a franchise's stagnation kills off the manifestation of Danganronpa's heart, because that's exactly what happens when you let a beloved franchise go on for too long. Danganronpa is meant to subvert expectations, but by continuing in this way, it creates a whole new set of expectations it must ruthlessly follow, which can be seen multiple times after this chapter. In fact, it actually starts immediately after Kaede's death with the choice of the new protagonist, Shuichi Saihara. Not only is Shuichi a lot more similar to the protagonists we have before, but as the ultimate detective, he is the only character in the mainline games to repeat an ultimate talent, as Kyoko Kirigiri of the first game was also the ultimate detective. With the exception of the ultimate lucky student, which isn't really an ultimate talent and has been established in the games that there is one every year, every other character in these games has had a unique ultimate talent. The fact that Shuichi has been chosen as the ultimate detective again shows that Team Danganronpa has officially ran out of ideas, a warning for what's to come later on in the game. I believe there is a clear divide on how Danganronpa V3 was written before and after Kaede Akamatsu died. While the prologue in Chapter 1 took great risks in ways people thought couldn't be possible on the Danganronpa game, the chapters afterward feel a lot more by the books and derivative of the tropes seen in Sugar Happy Havoc and Goodbye Despair. Chapter 2 has a sympathetic blacken and a serial killer. Chapter 3 had a double murder with an unsympathetic killer. Chapter 4 had the deaths of a muscular character and a robot? N not you. Uh, yeah, that guy. And Chapter 5 was nearly identical to the Chapter 5 in Goodbye Despair. Just taking a look at V3's first and second motives really highlights the difference between these two halves. The first motive is actually divided into two, the first motive being that whoever kills can leave without a trial, giving players the suspense of two people being gone before the very first class trial, and the second motive is a time limit in that everyone dies if no one kills adding even more suspense. Meanwhile, the motive in Chapter 2 is quite literally a rehash of the very first motive in the series. To be fair, I did enjoy Chapter 2's motive a lot and what they did with it. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. While many people, myself included, criticize V3 for retreading the same ground, especially since we as viewers are now aware of these tropes after the second game, I believe that this flaw is a very intentional decision by the writers to convey the message that I've been talking about in this video.
In addition to quite literally reusing stuff from previous games, such as with Shuichi's talent and the second motive, V3 emphasizes the fact that the series would become stale and lifeless if it goes on for too long through its use of Chekhov's gun. Now, if you don't know what that is, Chekhov's gun is a writing principle that states that if a certain detail or element is brought up in a story, it will pay off later on. Chekhov's gun is used a lot in the Danganronpa series, especially in the first game. For example, in the first case of Trigger Happy Havoc, not only is the extra space in the last trial mentioned, but the possibility of an accomplice was brought up by Byakuya. Both of these elements played off with Mukuro, the 16th student, and Gifumi serving as Celeste's accomplice. V3 plays with the expectation of Chekhov's gun by establishing two concepts that haven't occurred in Danganronpa before two separate murderers in the third investigation, and the possibility of two characters tying for a blackened vote. Because of Chekhov's gun and the experience from the previous two games, you would expect that both of these situations would happen in the future. But as we all know, neither happened. Karekio killed both Tenko and Angie, and no one ever tied for the blackened vote, even when it would have been incredibly useful in the fifth case. One main philosophy of Chekhov's gun is that you should not do something like this, otherwise you set people up with false hopes, only for them to be let down. And I think that is exactly why V3 decided to frame those concepts in this exact way. The fact that these possibilities were brought up in a similar way as they were in the previous games implies that the first two Danganronpa games would have gone through with such creative ideas. But Danganronpa V3, the 52nd killing game, wait, the 5th the third killing game in universe decided to opt out of such potential, instead going for the much safer twists to keep to the classic Danganronpa formula. There must be only one third killer who must be unsympathetic. There must be a muscular person and a robot dead by the end of chapter 4. The rival must be the victim of chapter 5 and the assistant must be their killer. Why? Well, that's how it always is. Just like how Junko is always the mastermind. Even if it's boring and repetitive, that's how it works. And the fans will eat it up regardless. We can just do the same Danganronpa formula over and over and over again. Hope overcoming despair every single time and no one will get tired of it. With this kind of mentality, the Danganronpa franchise will last forever! Be honest with yourselves. Is that really what you want? Is that really what any fan wants? Sure, it's always good to have more of something you like, but you can only replicate that thing's greatness so many times, and once that's over, what's left? The true horror of Chapter 6 isn't that the characters realize they are merely fictional characters. That's something we knew from the beginning. No, uh, the true horror comes from the way Team Danganronpa treats these characters. And I don't mean how they force them to kill each other. What was once a series that was cherished for its unpredictable story has been reduced to a series of tropes in a predictable formula that can be easily and effortlessly be repeated over and over and over again without any care in the world. In the same way that the characters have been forced to watch their loved ones be horrifically desecrated, all to continue a franchise that is going on for too long, we too had to witness the same failure occur to the Danganronpa franchise itself. When I first experienced V3's ending, I thought it was a hateful declaration against Danganronpa and everything it stood for. Now, I realize that it is the biggest love letter in the franchise you could have ever gotten. Because if you truly love something, you gotta let it go. I think you and I can finally understand what Kudaka meant when he envisioned the player to side with Shuichi to end Danganronpa. Then again, this is just my silly little interpretation. Death of the author and all. Although this reading of V3 makes me appreciate the game a whole lot more, people still have a right to dislike the ending and the many missed opportunities the game set up and failed to deliver. Heck, I still personally dislike those parts of V3 myself, even when I understand why they did it. Just because you intentionally made a poor writing choice doesn't make that choice any less poor. Though, that does bring up a really interesting question. Would you accept a work having lesser surface level content if doing so gives way to stronger themes? Speaking of which, what do you believe the ending of V3 represents? This ending is intentionally made to be ambiguous, so there really are no wrong answers. Okay, maybe there are some wrong answers, but you know what I mean. Anyway, as always, I'm Once Media, great adventures await!
Skinny, skinny, skinny. Yeah. Ha!